It's about as innocent a thing as anyone can do uh, to go and grab a cup of coffee before the working day has fully started. Um, decent, innocent people uh, who got caught up in the sick fantasy of uh, a deeply disturbed individual. There are many facets of terrorism that should frighten us. The pocket nuke, the coordinated band of fanatics, those who plot for years before delivering a blow that kills thousands. But the one both we and every other nation on earth cannot seem to get a solid handle on is what they call the lone wolf. And Australia demands we find some answers. Quickly. He is a noted national security expert and political analyst. Consultant to government agencies, obviously someone who gets under the skin of enemies, as the Muslim Brotherhood once called him delusional. Ryan Morrow is in the house. Ryan, thanks so much for being here again. Thanks for having me. Ryan, we hear those words, lone wolf, in what happened in Sydney. However, let's stop for a moment. How do we know that this was a lone wolf? What is the criteria that we're using here? And is it possible that in a situation like this, we jump too quickly to use that phrase? Well, let's ask ourselves what a lone wolf really is. I mean, the authorities are going through his communications. They're going to find out who he was talking to, whether the arrest of another Islamic State supporter in the morning triggered this, that this guy may have been uh, in communication with. But this term of lone wolf, I think, is misleading. And one of the points I've been making at clarionproject.org, where I work, is that it's misleading because you're never really alone. This is an ideology that's international in scope. You can go on the internet, communicate with people around the world, read their writings. So it's not really someone isolated in a basement that just becomes radical. There is a social element in every single case of this. But when we look at the phrase lone wolf, and again, let's work off what you just said here. This is an individual like so many others who apparently have been involved in chat rooms, have been involved on the internet. There was some sort of communications. But not only that, this is somebody who actually watches what happens on the net, this wonderfully dark media presence that ISIS has out there that incites people, that enrages them, that gets them involved. Is that still a lone wolf? Because in a sense, are they not being conditioned, if you will, brainwashed by others? It's not as if they just came up with it out of the blue. Right. And that's really my point is because if we say it's a lone wolf, what the average person is going to assume is, OK, well, this was just a crazy person and you can't do anything about the inevitable crazy person that engages in criminal activity, whereas I view this as an ideological war. And this, I, this debate, which is really false, about whether this qualifies as an ISIS attack or not is misleading also because they don't have membership cards. This is an ideological movement. If you believe in the cause, you fight for the cause, then you're a member. We wouldn't be having this argument about the communists during World War II or about the, or the communists during the Cold War or about the Nazis during World War II. If you sympathize with that movement and you contribute to it, even on your own accord, then you're a member of the enemy forces. Ryan, then let's take the gloves off here. In this ideological war, how do we then, how does America then try to find these individuals? How do we, what are we missing in not being able to identify them? And again, I'm saying gloves off here. What is the real thing that we need to do? Get down to it. Honestly, it's going to have to come down to going after the Islamist ideology, not going after Islam as a whole or Muslims as a whole, uh, going after the Islamist ideology. So how do you separate the two? Extent. How do you separate those two then? Sure. Well, the majority of Muslims don't believe in theocracy. They don't want to combine mosque and state. If you are a supporter of the Muslim Brotherhood or a supporter of Hamas, even if it's protected under free speech, then you get put on a watch list. You get, you get uh, monitored. Uh, we have to start focusing on that instead of just these individual tactics of violent extremism, as it's called, because Sheikh Haron paraded as a nonviolent guy. He said, I support terrorists, I believe in their cause, but my jihad is the jihad of the pen. And most people said, okay, well, that means that he's nonviolent. No, he's just saying at that moment, he's just writing letters. He's not condemning violence or saying he won't become violent. He's just using deceptive language, uh, taking advantage of this undue focus just on the act and not the ideology that leads to the act. 20 seconds, though, and then we'll take a break. But are we not talking about something here and identifying these people that will slap at civil liberties almost every single instance? Well, I would argue that we don't have to prosecute people for free speech. Uh, if they want to go out there and say, I support Hamas, for example, uh, then allow them to do that because from an intelligence perspective, I want them to run their mouths. Uh, that's how we figure out who we need to watch. 
who they're talking to, and there's more benefits from that than prosecuting them for something like that. All right, stand by. Ryan Morrow returns after a short break. We'll tackle the brutal and horrible slaughter in Pakistan and what lessons we have to take from that attack as well. And at 51 minutes after the hour, the water cooler dispenses the news we cannot stop talking about. And some students are really going to come to the water cooler on this one. It's all coming up on Midpoint. Welcome back to Midpoint. National Security Analyst for ClarionProject.org, Ryan Morrow, joins us. Ryan, I want to turn to Pakistan in a moment, but let's go back to what happened in Australia here and some of the ideological that you're talking about. One thing we didn't cover. We are looking at an individual who was allowed to stay in the country, a refugee. This is someone who supposedly should have been kept track of by the Australian authorities. Let me just go ahead and propose something here. Are we looking at a time that we're eventually going to get to where if you want to come to this country or any other country, you need to be able to be tracked 24-7, and if you break the law once, once, this guy broke the law many times, and he got to stay in the country. Are we reaching a point where we're going to have to have a basic, uh, basic one-shot-and-you're-out policy here in order to protect us from these ideologists and keep them from becoming ingrained in the society? Oh, definitely. I don't think that it's going to move towards 24-7 monitoring, but yes, you, you get arrested and you get convicted of something, then you're out of here. It's going to, That's what it's going to come to, and I think that's what's going to follow in Australia right now. If you look at the Australian websites, they're already talking about modifying their immigration laws because this guy came over to Australia from Iran in 1996. He was supposedly a refugee. He immediately starts acting up. He has between 40 and 50 uh, incidences of sexual harassment or sexual abuse. He's now been implicated in torching his ex-wife to death. Uh, so by, by any standard, this guy should not have been there. And what's really shocking for me is the fact that Sheikh Haron apparently was not on Australia's terror watch list. How that makes sense, I, I have no idea because e even analysts like myself knew about the extremism of this individual long before this incident happened. Does it not mean, though, <laughs> that we're reaching a point in this society, whether, whether, again, whether it's America or Australia, there has to be a complete vetting of an individual who wants to come in this country and stay here for any length of time. We have to know more about them because, and again, I'm not trying to say that just because somebody believes in a religion or they're a certain color, whatever, that's not the point. We're talking about knowing their background and knowing that they can be a danger to the society. And that in itself is strictly what 21st century life is going to be, whether we like it or not. I don't know that it's inevitable that's going to come to that. Uh, but I think that events like this are going to force us to seriously consider it. And you know what? I hope that we do have more scrutiny of individuals who are coming here. Because coming to the United States or Australia or anywhere else is a privilege. It's not a right. Uh, you don't have a right to come here uh, just because you exist. Um, if you come here, you, you should be able to pass a background check. Uh, you should not be uh, stoking extremism. It doesn't even have to be Islamic extremism. If you're a supporter of racism or sexism or anything like that, you don't deserve a spot here. Someone else should take your spot for you. Who's going to make that decision, though? Isn't that the biggest question? Well, that, that's going to have to be the federal government and to some degree the states. And that becomes dangerous in itself because then you start people starting to make decisions that aren't logically based. And then you have all those isms that walk into somebody else's opinion as well. Uh, this is a discussion for another time. A couple of minutes we have here. In Pakistan, 141 people are dead, 132 children. This is the Taliban. How do we then, outside of the lone wolf, how do we start looking for these people? What do we need to do to find them? Because they are always trying to, when they're not in a group, they're trying to keep themselves private and quiet so they can't be found. What aren't we doing? Well, in terms of those that are quiet, that's why it ultimately does have to come down to facing the ideology, uh, working with Muslim communities especially in order to find them out. And there have been many cases where Muslims have helped the NYPD or the FBI in finding these individuals. But in Pakistan specifically, uh, we know of lots of terrorist camps that continue to exist, have existed for years. They're going to have to be eliminated. And in terms of the ideology, it's not just about the Pakistani Taliban. You have other groups like lashkar e taiba and, and these other groups that have schools and hospitals. Uh, there's even been reports recently about schools in Pakistan that are still praising Osama bin Laden. Uh, so we, we've got to go after the infrastructure that leads to things like this, not just the individuals perpetrating them.
45 seconds. Are we afraid to face this ideology simply because of political correctness? I think so, but it's a political correctness limited to the West. And what I mean is, is that if I say Islamist, there's groups out there that will say, well, that's Islamophobic. Uh, you're, you're spreading anti-Muslim bigotry. But if you look at the press in the Arab world, especially in places like Egypt, they use terms like radical Islam or political Islam or Islamist constantly, and everyone knows what it means, and no one gets offended. Fair to say, then, that our head is in the sand and overseas. They certainly understand the danger point here, but we just don't want to face it yet. Right. But places like the Middle East understand this much more than we do. And that's why you have the White House currently saying that the Muslim Brotherhood is nonviolent and not a terrorist group. You look over in the Middle East, uh, not just the governments, but the average people there, many of them are saying to the U.S., what are you doing? Of course this is a radical group. Of course they believe in violence. Unfortunately, we still have to come to grips with what the 21st century world is. ClarionProject.org is where you're at. Ryan Morrow, we want to thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. If we don't see you before then, have a very Merry Christmas. You too. Thank you. All right. Take care. A new Surgeon General is on the job, but have we reached the point where this position is simply no longer necessary? And then there comes out to Ebola and lies in 2014. Nick Tate makes the house call right after the break on Midpoint.